Okay. Welcome to the 2017 Mupe Dean Competition, and thank you to everyone who's joining us today um, here in the room and watching on the live stream. Before we begin, please um, turn off your cell phone so that you do not interrupt the presentations. Um, we are in the Cardozo One division. The teams competing in this division are Hyman Brand Hebrew Academy, Yachad, Merkaz High School, Louisville High School of Jewish Studies, Eula Girls High School, the Weber School, and David Posnack Jewish Day School. We'd like to thank the judges, who are not only here with us today, but have invested time and thought into reading and providing feedback on your written decisions. I'd like to invite the judges to each stand um, and introduce themselves to the room. Jeffrey Actor, Houston, Texas. Rachel Sultan, Neely, Houston, Texas. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Um, the competition works as follows. Each team will have eight minutes for presentation, and there will be eight minutes for Q&A. Our timekeeper is Michal. She will give each team a one-minute warning and a 30-second warning. Even if you are mid-sentence, you must stop. You do not need to use your full eight minutes of presentation, and the judges do not need to use their full eight minutes for questions. There will be a five-minute break in between each team, and at the start of the break, the timekeeper, the timekeeper will announce, will invite the next team to get set up on the stage. There will also be two longer breaks throughout the competition. After the final team has presented, there will be a lunch break, and the judges will deliberate, following, followed by a closing ceremony at 12.30 down in Sam Houston. For those watching the live stream, to view the closing ceremony, go to Prisma CJDS YouTube channel at 12.30. Thank you all, and Bahat Slacha. The first team up is Hyman Brand Hebrew Academy. for us to move this back a little bit? Yeah? Cool. Just like shift it over a little bit. <laughs> we want you to be able to see our face. Hello? Convene the session of the Beit Dean, where we will examine the case brought forward by Mr. Shimon Shalom. So I was driving home from work when this happened. Apparently, a self-driving car swerved out of the way when a pedestrian jaywalked and an autonomous car violently T-boned my car. I was very shaken, but Baruch Hashem, my injuries have healed, and after some time, I was able to return to work. I originally sued Mrs. Rubenstein for damages, but she was pretty uncooperative. I was in a self-driving car. There's nothing I could have done. Why should I have to pay damages when Eli Levine, the CEO who programmed my car, is responsible for the car's response to the jaywalking pedestrian? So the court decided to call up Mr. Levine as well. This is ridiculous. I wasn't the one who caused the car to swerve. You bought the car. What you do with it is not up to me. Nonsense. What my car did was exactly up to your program. Okay, settle down. Order. Before we get ahead of ourselves, let's discuss the types of halachic damages at play here. I suffered several injuries, time off work, and car damages, all enumerated in Bavakama 8.1. Unfortunately, when operating under halachic laws of damages, autonomous car is not mentioned. However, Bavakama does tell us that we can classify the car as a pit, the fire, the chewer, or the ox. We might need to bring an expert in on this one. Your Honor, I am prepared to argue that this car be classified as an ox. Objection! I believe the car to be in the category of a fire. I will allow each of you time to present your case. Ms. Rubenstein, you may have the floor. The car must be an ox because it is mobile and it can make its own choices when faced with unexpected situations. Can it really make choices, though? Yes, the car chose to swerve into you. Actually, it didn't. The car is more closely aligned with the halakhic definition of fire. See, the car does not think. It moves but does not possess the breath of life. 
Its actions are uncontrollable, not unpredictable. It is made of metal and electricity. It simply cannot be alive. Besides, it's like how we're not supposed to use electricity on Shabbat because it's prohibited to light fire on Shabbat. The electricity in the car is the same. Let me see. If only we had an animal expert to understand if the car does indeed reflect the animal-like characteristics of an ox. Your Honor, I'm a zoologist. Well, my wife calls it a hobby. Part-time, you know? What does that have to do with anything? Based on my knowledge of animals, I have compiled a halakhic argument of my own. Mr. Shalom is correct. Oxen, like the car, will sometimes get surprised by stimuli in their environment and then react independently. But fire can't make its own decisions once it has been set. When Miss Rubenstein turned her key, my programming decisions were activated. The logs of this fire were set and all co control over the car was relinquished. If and when the car becomes an agent of destruction, it is as difficult to control as the fire, which, as Shim Shimot 22.5 says, starts and spreads to thorns, so grain is consumed. In Baba Kama 9b to 10a, it is stated that the fire's nature is to move around and consume both appropriate and inappropriate things. The Aliva is programmed to drive from point A to point B and to mitigate fatalities. This is the appropriate nature of the fire, like the Aliva. However, the Aliva also swerved and injured Mr. Shalom, undoubtedly a consumption of inappropriate things. This law of unintended consequences is characteristic in both the Aliva and the fire. It is exceedingly clear to me that the, that the car, though capable of reacting to a situation, is an inanimate object with decisions based only on original human action and not its own. But now that we've classified the car as fire, how would that classification impact the culpability of either Mr. Rubenstein or Mr. Le, or Mr. Levine? And would the classification as fire impact whether or not Mr. Levine has a responsibility to change the car's programming? Yes, I think that the classification of fire totally pins all damage responsibility on Eli. Is it not true that in Bava Kama, Rava says that the Mishnah supports Rabbi Yochanan, who said, he who set the fire must pay because it is his arrows? The Mishnah does not support Reish Lakish, who says, a person is liable for fire because it is his property. The car is my property, so therefore I don't have to pay anything, and it's Eli's arrows, so he does. I do not follow. Ms. Rubenstein, I agree. There are two Mishnahic types of ownership for a fire, one who sets the fire and the one who owns it. In general, we say that someone who has a fire not only owns it, but is, the direct, but is the direct agent that causes it to damage. This designation is the direct arrows that Ms. Rubenstein mentioned. However, in this case, there are two entities, the Oliva and Ms. Rubenstein, who each have different types of ownership. Oliva is much more like the direct arrow that sets the original fire by programming the car, and Ms. Rubenstein, own, and Ms. Rubenstein owns the fire because she benefits from it, but does not have any ability to control it. But while that may be true, a person is not liable when under severe duress, according to the Ramban. That helps me too. I was under severe duress because the Ramban said that in an uncontrollable event, aka severe duress, which this was for me as there's no override option in the car, I would not be liable. I disagree. Tosafot states that a person who causes damage, as opposed to damage caused by a person's property, is exempt in cases of duress, since it is kind of like theft. I am the direct agent of these damages, therefore I am under duress. I see. And according to Tosfot, with damage caused by a person's property, the property owner is not under duress. As a result, Ms. Rubenstein is not under duress, and therefore she becomes solely culpable for the damages. Well, shoot. And in terms of how the money will be paid, Ms. Rubenstein should be the primary source of recompense. Let me get this straight. So Ms. Rubenstein isn't under duress because she is the property owner, rather than the direct agent of damage, like me. But was I liable for selling the car to her? Baba Kama 10A maintains that if fire was handed over to a deaf mute, the one who hands it over is not liable. Well, Ms. Rubin, the person who hands it over is me. While Ms. Rubenstein is neither a child nor a deaf mute, the lack of an override option renders her as helpless as if she were. So I'm not liable for having sold the car to Rubenstein. That same source declares that fire is forewarned from the beginning. If Mr. Levine is not responsible for the act of having sold a forewarned object, then because I am forewarned, I am fully liable, podcast or no. So Mr. Levine, as the direct agent of the Oliva, is considered to be under this umbrella of duress and not liable for damages, whereas I don't qualify du for duress and am liable. So can my insurance cover the accident? Yes, Ms. Rubenstein, your insurance can cover the cost if you choose not to pay out of pocket. In accordance, but in accordance to the teachings of Rabbi Moshe Sternbach, you need not pay twice. Uh, Ms. Rubenstein, that much is up to you. Great, so I'm off the hook, right? Ms. Rubenstein can take care of the damages and I'll be on my way. While I appreciate that Mrs. Rubenstein will be covering my damages, I want to ensure that no other person must endure what I did because of this car's dangerous programming. 
I heard no honk, no warning before my car was struck. There must be some repair for this. I recall an incident related in Bavacama in which a jug owner and a beam owner are walking one after the other. The jug owner who is first stops without warning and is liable when the jug breaks. If the jug owner had said stop, however, he would have been exempt and the whole debacle could have been averted. It's true. The car failed to give warning to Mr. Shalom. This is not only a halakhic issue, but a general safety one as well. Something you should have recognized before selling your car in the first place. Therefore, Levine, you must order a recall and change the programming to include some kind of warning or honk. You must offer the repair to anyone who currently owns a car free of charge. I will be paying Mr. Shalom's damages. I have to recall the Oliva. I am satisfied. Case closed. a slow down explanation of the following question. So I need to understand how Rachel is one for you cl clarification. Did you claim that she was forewarned? Yes, that she's liable from the start. Okay. I need to understand I need more clarification about her not being under duress. Okay, so our main source for this um, was the Bava Kama 22A to B, um, where it states that Rava said um, the Mishnah supports Rabbi Yochanan, who says um, the verse, if a fire spreads, even if the fire spreads on its own, he who set the fire must pay. Learn from that this is his fire, um, is because it is his arrows. Um, whereas, so it would be the arrows of a leaf of Oliva Industries, the person who programmed the car, rather than the property owner. Um, um, and later in Tosafot, um, Bava Kama 27B, SV Ishmael, um, it, it states that a person who causes damage as opposed to damage caused by a person's property is exempt. So we've already classified Mr. Levine as the direct arrows, so therefore they are exempt, but it says specifically as opposed to damage caused by a person's property, which has that distinction between the property owner, Ms. Rubenstein, and the direct arrows, Mr. Levine. Where was the, it was the, to okay, got it. Tosfet, got, got it. it. <laughs> I, I have two questions. So <clears throat> if uh, your designation uh, is fire, then are you saying that every time any one of us turns the ignition on our car, we're starting a fire? Well, in a sense, if we're talking about the halakhic damages, um, the car is not a fire itself, but we have to categorize it as some sort of halakhic damage. And just like a fire, the car is supposed to do good things. You can use a fire to light you know, a hearth or to light candles for light. Um, and a car similarly has lots of great uses, mainly transportation, but so it can be nature of destruction. Right. What we're talking about here is a mode of transportation. A car, is fire a mode of transportation? So a regular car would, that you control would be a, an extension of a human, um, like a human body, like a weapon. But this self-driving car um, thinks by itself and moves by itself. Not thinks by itself, but it's, um, we liken this to fire. Not because it's a vehicle, just because the way it moves and the way it works. And that to some extent you relinquish all control over the vehicle, over the fire, once you set once you ignite the fire or once you turn the key of the car, you, to, to some extent, can, well, in this case, she has absolutely no control, but you set the fire and then it spreads and grain is consumed. I have one more question. So when it starts the fire, mm -hmm. does it matter that something happened that was beyond the control of the person who started the fire? When she got in the car, she shouldn't have known that something could happen beyond her control. So it's a strict liability situation. You turn the ignition on, you drive the car, you've started a fire, and you're liable, notwithstanding something happens that you have no control of, that it was unintentional, as uh, stated in uh, Tosafot uh, Baba Karma 27b where they talk about severe duress and duress, unavoidable circumstances. Mm -hmm. what, 
why don't you give more weight to that? So we were considering that, but we thought um, that the the very last sentence um, was pretty cogent and clear in stating that um, it is not about whether you are the direct agent of that damage, but it is about whether you are the property owner when it comes to duress. So because she is the property owner, she does not fall under that umbrella of duress. Um, but at the same, and then at the same time, um, Mr. Levine would not be responsible for having handed over the keys to, um, to Ms. Rubenstein because of the source um, that states that um, a, when you hand over a pit to a deaf mute or to someone who is unable to, um, to take care of that agent of damage, um, they are liable, whereas when you hand over a fire to someone who cannot take care of the fire, they are not liable. Mm -hmm. um, so we thought it was pretty. Another thing for that, um, in Baba Kama 10A, it says that the pit is more strict than the fire, since the pit um, was dangerous from the beginning, implying that fire was not dangerous from the beginning, but obviously fire can just like blow in, burn something, and the property of fire is to destroy, just like this car. But when you light a fire, you have to know that it could spread. So a fire is not technically where it's not, it, like she didn't, she didn't get into a dangerous vehicle, she got into a car. But something could happen, and it did and it went and destroyed. Yeah, and we know that the fire is forewarned from the beginning from the, from the same source, Baba Kama 9A, B to 10A, but we know that because you can hand it over to a deaf mute or a child, there is this element of, there's things that anyone can use fire for, including the property owner, Miss Rubenstein, where they know that the fire is forewarned from the beginning, and that's why, because they're the property owner and they're holding on to this entity, which is the car or the fire, they know that it's forewarned from the beginning and have that element of liability, but at the same time, they should be using it and they have the ability to use it for pleasure and for benefit. Thank you. I have just one quick question, final question. Is there any defense to turning, to starting the fire when you turn the ignition? Is there any defense that a driver has uh, to, to that action, or is it just you turn the ignition on, you started a fire, you're liable for anything that else happens? Um, well, we, we think that, that Ms. Rubenstein could have um, chosen not to purchase the vehicle and that that um, responsibility sort of lies on her um, when it comes to an autonomous car, which is um, such a liability in and of itself. Um, but we also believe that with the proper recall um, and with um, with more preemptive measures, the car, like the whole situation, could have been averted. I also want to add that the car, um, <clears throat> it's not as if it were a normal car where it's like a just a agent of herself and there's room for human error, but because it's a separate entity, she's holding on to it knowing that she can't control whatever happens and that there has to be that forewarning from the beginning that just, I think, goes inherently with the fact that she owns the car and uses it. So one quick question then with 30 seconds left. Um, you didn't discuss the uh, responsibility of the pedestrian. Well, we liken the pedestrian to um, an uncommon gust of wind, something, a case of duress that we can't control and we can't track down the pedestrian and there's no way to involve them in this case. And can you uh, at least extend that to the example of fire and the application of fire? Um, sure. When, like uh, Haiti said, an uncommon gust of wind, if a fire Time. is contained. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.